I'm a sculptor. Um, I've been making sculpture for over 50 years now, actually, so um, well practiced. Um, I think I, I'm going to show you some work that I did really before I went to art school, and then I'm going to jump 10 years to the first major exhibition I had after graduating, after doing a couple of research fellowships. Um, hopefully it'll make some sort of sense in actually contextualizing the work that I do and the reasons for why I'm using the technology in the way that I do at the moment. Uh, you'll see that I started using additive manufacturing quite early on in the 70s, but without machines. So I think with no further ado, if my presenter works. Okay, this is work that I did uh, before I went to art school. Um, I don't know why. I think I've got the sculptor's gene. Uh, I never knew my grandfather, but he was a stonemason, so uh, it often skips a generation, I think, in, in genetics. And for some reason or another, carving really appealed to me when I was a teenager. And I didn't start actually until after I'd left school at 15 without any academic qualifications whatsoever and uh, uh, took up employment with my father in a thriving butchering business, which I think might have actually had some sort of uh, uh, effect on the work that I did that follows. However, I'm going to uh, jump 10 years now. Uh, the ambient light in here is uh, a little strong for some of these slides, but uh, this is a sawdust installation. Um, additive manufacturing, I guess, layer manufacturing, one particle at a time. I think it's important to say that I've always worked directly with materials rather than indirectly as many designers do. And as a fine artist, I'm quite privileged, I guess, because I'm not tied by a brief. I don't have a client. I'm free to do whatever I like, to follow my nose and wherever that might take me. So working with serendipity and materials and processes and techniques, that's the way that I move forward. I think the basic concerns have something to do with exploration, discovery, realization, followed by meaning and understanding. Um, when I begin a piece of work, I invariably have no real idea where I'm going to end up. So that said, I think I'd best move on, because there's a sort of visual essay here that will hopefully explain to you what I'm doing today. Uh, this piece of work oh, is perhaps both additive and subtractive. It's a field of sawdust uh, laid out on the, on the floor and then with a snow shovel, I push the sawdust out. And so without a laser scanner, I can try to use my finger. Um, these elements here and those channels going down through the piece are not modeled by hand. They're a result of the material and the importance of the material in the making process. Uh, one of the fathers of modern sculpture, Constantin Brancusi, coined the term truth to material. A truth is a rather contentious word, but I think the appropriateness of material is important. What he said of his contemporaries and predecessors alike was that they work in beefsteak, making anatomies, representations, and copies, uh, producing them in uh, corpses in stone. You know? And so I think that for the very first time, a sculptor turned to the material and the qualities of the material in the work as being a very important aspect of it. Moving on from that quickly, uh, here I've simply tipped out 25 bags of sawdust and allowed gravity to take over. Gravity is very important, and I'll talk about that in terms of embodiment when I get towards the end of my talk. So um, here, uh, another piece, really, I did when I was a fellow at Cheltenham School of Art. Uh, that's an open system uh, using Fibonacci, adding the previous two things together to get the third. I suppose the question is, really, uh, do the bricks go through the sawdust, or does the sawdust go through the bricks? Of course, we know the sawdust is soft, and so we assume that the bricks are solid, uh, which is quite right. But as you'll see in my later work, uh, working with uh, complex geometries and topology with self-intersecting objects, uh, there are references back to this work. And it's only through giving presentations like this about my work that I began to realize how far back the process actually goes. So uh, this is a closed system. It's the same thing, but it's closed and not open. Um, Moving on from that very quickly, and I'm, I'm jumping years here as well, you know, in terms of process. I worked with trees for about 15 years. Um, after, after I'd finished a, a fellowship in Cardiff, I moved back to Cheltenham. And I'd been shortlisted for the Grysdale Sculpture Residency the first time it was advertised, but I didn't get it. So I had started thinking about what might I do with trees. And so here, another reference, I think, to CAD modeling and, and the regular tools that are available there. I've morphed a tall cone into a pyramid. Uh, simply by slicing up the tree, what I've done is I've taken an average diameter 
of the base of the trunk of the tree. They were all blown trees, by the way, that the farmer allowed me to clean out his woods for him, which was a godsend to me at the time, free material. Um, and what I've done is I've, 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 I've taken an average diameter, doubled it, and then cut that much off twice, and then measured it again. And so uh, the pyramid takes its form actually from the cone itself, from the material itself. I could have said, oh, well, I'll make it a centimeter less each time. That would be imposing something upon it, really, that didn't belong. Moving on from there, I, this is when I first started at uh, uh, Manchester Metropolitan University, which was then the Manchester Polytechnic. And uh, as well as a chainsaw, I had access to machine tools like circular saws. And I chopped this log up into uh, sticks, if you like, and then uh, pushed each one alternating uh, by the uh, same dimensions as the square on the end. So you get this kind of cube arrangement. And what I'm doing is I'm beginning to push an object through itself. Uh, here, another piece uh, working similarly, slicing up trees. And I guess it's a sort of layer manufacturing of sorts if one thinks about it in that way, although I certainly wasn't thinking about it like that at the time. Uh, here, I've sliced up a bunch of tree trunks of uh, even thickness slices, and then I've alternated by moving them in the, uh, ar ar along the x-axis so that they bump into each other, and that produces a hybrid object in between the two in each instance. And so in moving the slices around like this, quite accidentally without intending it, I'd cloned it. I'd made two seemingly identical trees, which were actually opposite to each other because all the odd slices are in one pile and all the even slices are in another. Moving on from there, I replicated it for an installation piece, and so there are two identical sets of objects here, one on one side of the room and one on the other. Uh, of course, moving on from that then, once I get onto an idea, I tend to push it around to see what I can get out of it. And so here, you know, we've got triplets uh, on this piece on the, on the right. There's one and two thirds of the same tree. I've cut a thin slice, a thin slice, and made two piles so that uh, the smaller one is a third of the material that I started with. And that gives me a unity. It gives me a completeness. It gives me a kind of resolved position. And of course, the third one is the virtual one that has passed into the distance uh, no longer in existence. Here on the left, uh, uh, nesting two objects together, one inside the other. And on the right, uh, twisting an object, which again is so easy in CAD, you just simply take your twist and turn by however many degrees you wish. Uh, the one on the left, uh, it, it turns uh, 360 degrees clockwise and then 360 degrees anti-clockwise. As well as triplets, in fact, these are, I don't know what the term would be, 25 pullets, the one in the middle, um, is really 125 slices that's dealt out like a hand of cards. So there are five slices in each pile, and then the various slices connect with each other with the relationship between themselves up the column. On the right, I've simply sent the logs up a kind of helical path. Uh, here was the uh, Liverpool uh, Garden uh, Festival. Um, uh, Liverpool uh, uh, Arborists provided me with three large scale elm trunks. I actually had to build a chainsaw track as a jig to cut them up very precisely to do this kind of work. But the point is, I skewed it into the hill. And I mean, if you're going to skew something, how far do you skew it? In this instance, the hill said stop. And so, moving on from there here, um, in the foreground is an elm tree. Now, it's been scaled in the z-axis to about one-third of its original height. And so it has expanded uh, on, on the x-axis, but not on the y. So it's sort of squeezing and stretching in a way that one wouldn't normally work with materials, really. However, in the CAD environment, that's very straightforward, very simple, and also very quick. And then came my first introduction to computers. Uh, uh, very expensive at that time. What day? We're looking mid-80s, really. And we got a Mac Plus in the Design for Learning Center in the university. And uh, in order to justify buying such an expensive computer, uh, at, at that time, I think Macs were really rather expensive compared to today. Um, it was open to the faculty and staff were invited along to have a look. So I went along to have a look. This program was called Mac Draw, and you could make a paintbrush, draw a quick paintbrush, and then if you moved the mouse fast enough, it would deposit them behind because the cache probably wasn't fast enough to actually draw them quick enough to, to, to put them up on, on the monitor through a, if it had a graphics card of some kind, I guess. And then we moved on from there. 
uh, to the Apple Macintosh 2CI. Incidentally, as an artist, I probably wouldn't have gotten involved with computers if it hadn't been for the drag and drop click and point Apple Macintosh. However, um, uh, this is Aldis Super 3D, probably one of the first versions. It didn't have uh, lighting or, or texture manipulation of any kind. You had colors and you had textures and that was it. But I could realize, and I think realize is a very important word, uh, it's different to recognize. Realizing is seeing something afresh. Recognition is cognition again. And so I tend not to work with recognition. I avoid symbolism. I've rarely worked with symbolism. So what you see is what you get and you take it or leave it. This enabled me to be able to think about uh, moving fairly hefty amounts of timber around. I mean, there's several tons there in those elm tree bowls, but I could manipulate them very quickly uh, with this very crude early CAD software. Um, here what I've done, it's a log. Uh, instead of just slicing, I've actually cut each slice into eight segments and then alternated each of those across a central sort of datum line in the z-plane. So it produces a perfectly symmetrical object that is asymmetrical in the center. Again, it's nested and it's turning through itself 180 degrees. Again, you'll see when I start working uh, further with CAD how I've made further use of this. Of course, I had to build the, uh, the jig in order to do that. I think I spent a summer vacation building this equipment to do it. It actually had a two meter bar, which you know, I could cut up sort of uh, you know, nearly two meter tree trunks should I wish to. I never quite got that big. I think about a meter it was as big a piece as I ever made. But I spent all that time making this and then uh, the idea was to be able to produce pieces like this in CAD. That would have been eight tree trunks of different diameters, cut up, and every slice made of a composite from all eight trees, and then put together. So the information is really running along the x-axis uh, quite precisely, and the pieces of material are moving from one column to the next. Early CAD again, just dropping back maybe a year here uh, to Aldous Super 3D again. Ed, what I'm doing is I'm playing with the material in CAD first before uh, going to build the things. And so here, um, again, without my laser point, it's tricky, but the way that curve slows down, I can't fit another piece in. The next piece that would actually end up on the floor beneath it, I made a model which demonstrated that. The idea was to have a room full of these things. I'm not explained too deeply what that's about, but the point being that really once you went to the virtual environment, then you don't have to deal with gravity as such in virtual reality. And so um, I wasn't, I, I don't think a rapid prototyping was readily available at that time. And I went virtual for a number of years. I also moved from the Mac to the PC because it had a greater versatility, uh, greater functionality, and our architects were using it. I looked at what they were doing. They had lights, they had materials, libraries, etc. And so uh, this was before Windows. I had to go through a little DOS threshold and in terms of how to operate the device, um, but it was able to produce much more sophisticated results than I could do on the Mac at the time, which was largely a DTP device. It wasn't really constructed to handle 3D in the way that the PC could, and the open architecture of PCs and the cards that you could put in to uh, do this kind of thing uh, was a kind of different world to the Apple Mac in those days. Uh, so having gone virtual, um, I, I got into doing some computer animation, this is a 12 minute animation that was actually intended uh, uh, to be projected in 3D in real space. I worked with the biomedical imaging group at De Montpellier University on something called integral imaging, which was rather like holography, and I spent several years working there. However, in 90, oh yes, that's a, a, I'm sorry about the, the ambient lighting, but uh, that's Professor Malcolm McCormack, uh, who was professor of uh, uh, computing technologies, electrical engineering at De Montpellier, and we worked together developing this technology. I actually invented this large screen projector to project CAD models into real space without the need for specs or anything. You could see spectators actually walking through the object. This was the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester in 2003. So uh, software gets more sophisticated, it becomes more intuitive, uh, you can work in real time and see what you're doing, whereas before in the early versions of 3D Studio, I think I used 3D Studio 2 way before Max uh, in the first place. It was a bit like life modeling in a way, that you would, you would look at the model, um, turn off the lights, and then go to your replication of it and model it 
in the dark and then turn the lights back on again to see what you'd done. It was a little bit like that. You'd go from one element of the software to another to another. Whereas now, you know, with all the multitasking, it's all happening in real time in those quadrant windows right before your very eyes. And so it becomes a very intuitive, spontaneous, direct activity. Here, I've been working with a torus knot uh, for something like 18 years now. Um, I, I, I was somewhat encouraged because I was looking at Brancusi's Sleeping Moose recently, and he worked over on that for over a 20-year period. So it's somewhat uh, uh, contradictory in a way as a creative person to do the same thing for 18 years. But as you'll see, I think I've done a, a fair amount with it. However, the thing about the CAD environment on the top left, uh, we've got a donut shape. Uh, the cross-section of that in the top left corner of the top left image, you can see the cross-sections. Now, in, in real terms, as a carver or a modeler, then the top right, you can take the diameter of the overall donut shape and reduce it. Now, with physical means, you can't reduce it any less than the sum of the diameter of the cross-section. But in CAD, you can actually pull that outside diameter in so that you get an intersecting, self-intersecting form and this rather strange kind of area in the middle of it. Now then, that's what's fascinated me and really what I've worked with uh, for some years now. In 1996, the Higher Education Funding Council's Joint Information Systems Committee's Joint Application Technologies Project, CALM, for creating art with their manufacture. There were no sculptors or fine artists in the UK at that time who were using CAD. Alan Ayres in Birmingham had scanned some stones and bones and had them produced on a layer manufacture machine. I'll show you a piece of that shortly. Um, so I didn't think that these materials would have any particular aesthetic qualities, and so I thought I would produce the final uh, piece of work in bronze. And so uh, this is the SLS uh, that was uh, produced in the first instance. We actually had to send letters out to all of the art schools in the land because we didn't have email in those days. And uh, we uh, recruited about 22 artists and designers to be involved in the CALM project. And I believe doubled the world number of artists and designers using the technology at that time, according to the director of the CALM project. So uh, SLS, I was gobsmacked when I saw the object. And I still am. You think you know this stuff absolutely back to front, inside out, upside down in CAD. But when it's made manifest as an object, it is something else. And that's where 3D printing really comes into its own, I think. I'm always surprised when I actually see that object produced. It's always an exciting moment. So I, I, I hadn't realized that the geometry and the layering kind of alias marking that you get on the surface of the object was really beautiful. And, and it, it exaggerated the form to some extent, which I'll explain in some of the works that follow from here. That's a cross section of the object. So you can actually see the intersecting geometries. Uh, I think it was Rodan who said, uh, conceive of form from within. Uh, don't imitate the outer surface of things. So in the way that we have a skeleton and it comes to the surface here and there, and we understand how that's working. Similarly, uh, with sculpture, uh, here, the interior is determining the exterior, it's a knot. And so I, I think what I'm trying to say there is that if I were modeling or carving this, I wouldn't know where to put that bit, you know, I mean, why would I put that there? My main interest here really was with the intersecting elements of the geometry where this piece passes straight through that. Again, very difficult to imagine, very difficult to uh, conceive of uh, through traditional means. And this goes back actually, Michael, to my, my third year at the Royal College and the, all the exams were over. I'd always wanted to learn bronze casting. And so this is a, a bronze cast that I did in, uh, uh, I think I actually uh, cast it from a stone carving back in 1975. Now the point of showing this is to do with the tension on the surface. The surface tension and the reflections. I think reflections must have been our first experience of a virtuality. And so, uh, this thing almost melts away, it's gorgeous, you know, it, it, it just almost disappears by reflecting its environment in it and deforming the environment as it goes. So, moving on from there, this is a, a Thermojet wax print uh, from 1999. Um, I burnished it rather than leaving the, uh, uh, the fingerprint of the build on it. And there's a, there's a reason for that, because as you can see, uh, these various elements pass through each other here and here. 
But when you get up to this curve here, then you're looking at a reflection of the form and not the form itself. And so uh, there's a kind of ambiguity between the real and the virtual there in terms of what is it and where is it. Uh, moving on from that here, uh, four tori, uh, they're all following the same path. But one of the things I can do with my software is to put lumps into the torus, rather like a snake getting tennis balls or something. You know, you can put as many lumps in there as you like. And I think each of the tori had a different number of lumps in it, and so they appear at different purses, places and um, protrude uh, through the surface of the object. Again, um, this is something that you can manipulate directly, spontaneously in CAD, and so you can actually see what you're doing as you do it. Of course, rendering uh, high-resolution rendering takes a little while now. You know, back in the 80s and 90s, it used to take days to render an image. There's another piece from 1999. Uh, 3D Systems kindly loaned me a Thermojet wax printer for an exhibition at the Museum of Science and Industry in Manchester. And um, I, I couldn't resist actually using the geometry, putting a lattice on it. Of course, lattices are everywhere now. Everywhere you look on every stand, we see lattices. It's one of the things that the technology can do. Here I'm uh, using the geometry. This is a, a bronze cast from a Thermojet wax print. And, you know, my kids grew up with, with computer games. And in the early days with the SNES, you know, you didn't have very good graphics. And so the next kind of version coming out would have materials or it would have lights or it would have reflections for your racing games or your fighting games or whatever. And so I, I think as a sculptor, I was wanting higher and higher resolution all the time. And then I realized, in fact, with pieces like this, that the geometry has something to say in the form. And I suppose I'm out of step with the universe as an artist. You know, I don't address the socio-political issues of postmodernist art, which the majority of artists are engaged with at the moment. I probably date back more to a classical form or way of working. Uh, it certainly isn't representational. And that's a piece that I had printed by ProMetal, a subsidiary of Extrude Hone. Uh, in Pittsburgh in the States and I was invited to, to go over there to print a piece, not this one, at a very complex geometry that they wanted to try out and they invited me over to a seminar and um, unfortunately they weren't able to build the piece that I'd hoped they could but as a, as a kind of consolation they built me this piece in uh, uh, steel. It's stainless steel powder, they use uh, an adhesive that they have the formula for to stick the particles together then they put it in a hydrogen furnace uh, uh, in a graphite container with a pile of bronze powder and at a certain temperature the bronze, the bronze powder is sucked into the porosity left by the, the glue being evaporated out of it to get a 100% dense uh, uh, metal that's as strong as investment casting. I had this piece done, oh it must have been uh, oh, early uh, in the first millennium, probably about 2003 I think. It's done with the LOM, the uh, it, 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 object lamination. Uh, it uses a sticky back label paper and a laser and a heat press uh, to actually cut every layer with the laser and it grids the excess material, rather like MCOR technologies do now with their A4 iris printer and uh, Matrix 300, which I'll get to shortly. Let it suffice to say that follows pretty much in the same mold as the previous pieces. And then, of course, with the Stratasys FDM technique, um, it was possible to generate much more complex objects because of the soluble support material. I mean, uh, kind of similar, I guess, to uh, SLS or the Z Corp or the Z printer now that uses powder as a support material. I call this piece Shoal, not because I wanted to look like a Shoal, but because and I named my son Mark, not because he was a Mark, but I needed to tell him from the other kids in the world, and so I gave him a name. It doesn't really have any symbolic reference. But that's done in ABS plastic, and I couldn't conceive of that by any other means. I think that the relationship between these elements is procedural. You know, I can't alter any of it. Um, if, I, if I reduce the number of vertices in it, the whole thing will self-reorder. And self-ordering, I think, is one of the things that I'm working with. The other thing is embodiment and grounding, which I'll get to shortly, I think. Uh, I had this piece made uh, well, 2011, not that long ago. Um, Laser Lines built it for me in their bureau at considerable expense, I might add, because it was a full envelope build 
14 inches by 14 inches by 16 inches, but an absolutely fabulous thing. Much is said about the kind of anonymity of white plastic objects, but I think if you sensitively, they have their aesthetic qualities. You can see in the, the bottom left image there, the uh, translucency of the material because of its thickness and the way that the light shining through it produces a rather wonderful effect. And then of course in the, uh, the bottom right there, it's absolutely sumptuous. It really is gorgeous, I think. And again, without uh, uh, an easily removable support material, that kind of object isn't really possible. Uh, here, I built these pieces on our own machine. Um, I bought two machines for our research institute a couple of years ago with uh, Fortis 360MC and uh, a Matrix 300 paper printer. And they've got the iris being demonstrated on the floor, which is where I'll be finishing my talk in about four minutes' time. So uh, here we have the uh, piece with the soluble support structures in place and um, a, a, a similar piece using the same technology. I think I call that piece star. It's all about what's happening in the center of it, really. Um, but again, it's, it, all of these works are governed by an invisible topological controller in the form of a torus knot. Uh, what I do is I wrap geometry around the vertices and wires and then deform it. Uh, I tried the same thing uh, or something very similar with the Matrix 300. And like all tools, they have their limitations, they have their pros, they have their cons. And so, you know, you wouldn't use a hammer to knock a screw in. You wouldn't try and drill a hole in the wall by putting the bit in the wrong way around. So you have to understand, I think, what 3D printing and the various different technologies can deliver before you decide to go to print. That's the first piece I ever did when we got the Matrix 300. I have a tendency to want to push technology through its paces and find out where its extremities are, where it breaks down, what I can get away with, what I can use. And so uh, this is really, in a way, given that these are just pieces of paper stuck together with PVA glue, it is asking a lot of it to achieve a form like this. And so having used it for a year or two, I became very familiar about how to orientate objects in the build in order to achieve elements within the composition that would perhaps be extremely difficult if you didn't know what you were doing with it. I mean, this is the same object from three different views. On the left, you can see these knife edges curving around the top. I didn't build it that way up. I built it horizontally so that the slices of the sheets of paper would hold the form. If I were building it that way up, you're going to have to stick a tiny little piece of paper on, the, on that very edge, which is a near impossibility, really. So, so long as you think through what you're doing, then uh, uh, quite a lot of it is achievable. Then moving on to color. Um, I've worked with color for many, many years, especially when I was working with integral imaging and 3D projection and such like. Uh, working with color here is amazing. I, I have a way, it's not in any manuals, and because I work using serendipity, I come across the unexpected. And I found that I could very quickly change the colors. Um, this is uh, an image from a spectrometer, and so I haven't aesthetically decided to put this color next to that one. There is a relationship between the colors in the same way that there's a relationship between all of the elements in the form. And then I had my very first uh, color print done on the iris just last week. And uh, the top two images are renders in CAD in 3D Studio Max, and the bottom two images are photographs of the actual object itself. They didn't have time to build it very big, but it is on their stand if you want to go and see the real thing. I saw it for the first time today. It's a bit strange making things that they're printed far away and you don't get to see them until you actually physically contact with them. You know, it's always exciting to see them for the first time. So uh, that's the same object. Unfortunately, again, the color's being bleached out. The, the thing is, it's WYSIWYG. I got what I expected to get. And of course, when you're modeling, you're using lighting, there's shading, you're not quite sure uh, how that color's behaving. So I was thrilled and delighted uh, with the output there. And color, I think, has got to be one of the next steps forward. There wasn't much of a use for color in rapid prototyping, but now we've moved to 3D printing, and the way the industry is diversifying and moving out to domestic applications, then color has become very important. And we see on the shop floor uh, many of the vendors beginning to generate very good uh, color uh, uh, objects. Um, now, this is, is tricky because it's uh, using a level of transparency. I wish you could see the colors on that monitor down there instead of that one. But, uh, however, uh, the point is that the color is buried and exposed within a translucent object. But I've just seen the Connex 3 for the first time. And some of the translucent colors that they can print is very, very exciting. And they've actually offered to run a few parts for me to see how it comes out. 
Uh, similarly, this piece, oh, it's got a, a level of 40% opacity, I think. So um, it's denser in the center than it is on its extremities, and so the color layers up and becomes more dense. So again, there's a relationship between the form and the color. And then the next thing is scale. I'm so envious of the architect who was showing these wonderful buildings prior to me. Uh, as a sculptor, of course, we don't have the resources uh, to, to, to be able to work on a, on a large scale. Other than CNC machining and various materials, I guess I could produce that in carbon fiber. I could have it carved by hand in Xiamen in China, you know, but um, again, uh, I think that's the future for me to begin to see some of these things on a larger scale.